The committee will come to order. The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is our mission statement. Today, we are, we are calling the third hearing conducted by the Oversight Committee, today a joint hearing, where we plan to uh, hold at least two additional TSA oversight hearings in April and May. There is no question that the TSA serves a vital role. The question is, in a post-9-11 period, are we getting value for our money? Do we, in fact, have a system which is thorough and complete that, in fact, takes care of all of us? Or do we have a fairly expensive, labor-intensive uh, system that, in fact, is not making us appreciably safer? In a time of budget limitations, TSA, although essential, must, in fact, deliver value to the American people. With more than 65,000 men and work women working for TSA, it is not a small agency. This is more men and women working for an aviation-based safety organization than build all the Ford automobiles in America combined. Only one quarter of the funds used by TSA come from aviation fees. Three quarters come directly from the American people, meaning those of us who do not fly are paying a heavy price for those who do. But even the billion and a half plus dollars paid for out of landing fees and other uh, collections, ticket fees, to run our airports, in fact, is a high price to pay, a burden, if you will, on our efficiency. So whether the dollars come from ticket fees or come from the taxpayer directly, it is essential that we review TSA's effectiveness. By 2013, TSA will arguably, by its own accounting, have wasted more than $500 million of taxpayer money developing advanced, tech, advanced imaging technology, or AIT, machines. In addition to public outrage over privacy violations, classified GAO reports paint a dire picture of ineffectiveness. GAO believes screening of passengers by observation techniques, or SPOT program, which has already cost taxpayers $800 million, is ineffective, and that Congress should consider limiting funds for this program. GAO, as a nonpartisan organization, claims that TSA deployed SPOT before having solid scientific basis for its effectiveness, and that when it worked, it was only an accident. Despite a potential $3.2 billion cost to the Federal Government and industry, GAO continues to find that TSA is failing to properly administer TWICE, the TWIC, the Transportation Worker Identification Credential. I have seen this failure myself. I have seen a mandated bio uh, ID simply waived. Showing a picture ID is not, in fact, what Congress mandated. Deploying these and deploying them in a way in which they are quick and uh, effective is essential. Let's remember, they cost a lot of money to produce the card. Simply using it as a high price ID card is not acceptable. Without creating a plan to upgrade its Explosive de Detection System, or EDS, which will cost $964 million or more to the taxpayer, TSA cannot ensure updating EDS <coughs> will be feasible or cost effective. Now, let me just reiterate, EDS is an important system. Whether it is the inadvertent uh, touching of fertilizer or the real operational use of explosive, we need to know, we need to screen. It is an effective tool if it works. If it doesn't work and work 100 percent of the time, we have the biggest problem we could possibly have. Lastly, the VIPER program, 
visual, intermodal prevention and response faces serious questions for, <clears throat> from both security experts and legal scholars about the effectiveness and constitutionality of this initiative. TSA is not performing or taking into serious consideration the cost benefits, and that is a big part of what this committee is here to ask questions on today. Not is it nice to have, not might it work, not do we must do something, but in fact, have we done a cost benefit analysis? Have we screened through many choices, developed, researched, but only deploy those which work? With those which work. In fact, what we do know here at this committee and at the Transportation uh, Committee is that we have fielded products that don't work in the past. And when it becomes known by the public that a product has a gaping flaw, that product becomes essentially useless. Sadly, what we discover is even when it becomes public, there is no other tool. So, in fact, we continue screening people knowing that screening alone is not enough and that the public knows that. And with that, I now recognize the uh, chairman of the, of the subcommittee on aviation infrastructure, Mr. Petrie, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for organizing this uh, important uh, hearing and uh, doing so with the Transportation uh, Committee. Uh, after 9-11, the Transportation Committee held a number of hearings to attempt to determine what happened and what needed to be done. And uh, it became very clear at those hearings that, that the then existing Federal policy of requiring easy access to the cockpit in case there was a medical emergency or something of that sort uh, was not uh, the most secure way to go. That policy was changed, and now our cockpits are uh, hardened. That is to say, it is very difficult for a passenger to take over an airplane and turn it into a weapon, as happened at 9-11. That, in my opinion, is the most significant security change uh, since that time. Uh, beyond that, of course, people can go on airplanes and possibly take a plane down, can create mischief, become a hairy, hairy person, as they could if they were to go to a football stadium or on a cruise liner or uh, any other sort of a train, other modes of transportation. We do have a security problem, but it is not restricted to airlines. And the major part of the danger of airlines, I think, uh, was dealt with when it became impossible for people to take over uh, the airplane and turn it into a weapon, as happened at 9-11. At that said, of course, we have this regime that all of us experience who serve in Congress, uh, if we live any distance at all, on a weekly basis practically, if not more often, uh, we are inspecting millions of travelers, uh, hundreds of thousands every month, the same people, over and over and over again. And uh, that has to be wasteful and intrusive. Uh, and we, this has been going on now for 10 years. Uh, if it is going to go on for another 10 years, it behooves us to come up with a more efficient, less intrusive, more sensible program so that uh, we concentrate on where there might be a risk rather than uh, inspecting the same people over and over and over uh, again. Uh, when we had hearings back at the time of 9-11, uh, experts came in, uh, testified before the Transportation Committee from Israel and a number of other countries that certainly have for many years faced very, very heightened security threats. Uh, hardening the cockpit was one of the things that they advised and which we did. Uh, other things that they have advised we have not done, uh, trying to tr track people. Uh, when they buy tickets and working on the intelligence side of things to see if there is some sort of a uh, likelihood that that person might be a, a risk, uh, prod, pro ways of inspecting people and how they behave, uh, not just at the airport looking through their, their drawers and socks and sniffing at their shoes, but uh, looking at how they interact with ticket agents, how they generally behave uh, not just at the airport, but uh, as they 
go about their business uh, preparing possibly to, to do things of risk. It seems to me that there are a lot more strategic and intelligent ways to go about it than spending hundreds of millions of dollars uh, impeding the growth of the transportation uh, 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 transportation sector, aviation sector, and basically uh, changing the psychology of Americans to have them starting to feel that they have somehow done something wrong and they are being subject to pat down and shake down as we do when we are worrying about someone who has committed a crime or, or being, uh, we are assuming everyone is guilty uh, and, and treating them practically like prisoners uh, when they are American taxpaying citizens. So I, th I feel that we have we've got a lot to do to straighten this whole mess out. It is not a cost effective or very disciplined approach. And after 10 years, uh, we would owe more to the American people. Mr. Chairman, thank you for having this hearing. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman yields back. I now ask unanimous consent that our colleague from Tennessee, Mrs. Blackburn, be allowed to participate in today's hearing without objection so ordered. I will now note that uh, the ranking members of each of the committees uh, are driving in and have been delayed. <laughs> so uh, uh, it is not a flight as far as I know. So uh, they will make their opening statements after our witnesses make theirs. Uh, I'm assured they will be here by then. And with that, I would like to now introduce our uh, first panel. Mr. First Christopher L. McLaughlin is the Assistant Administrator of Security Operations at the Transportation Security Administration. Mr. Stephen Sadler is the Assistant Administrator for Intelligence and Analyst Analysis at the Transportation Security Administration. Mr. Stephen Lord is Director for Homeland Security at the U.S. Government Accountability Office, our wing, if you will, and Rear Admiral Zukunt is the U.S. Coast Guard and an Assistant Commandant for Marine Safety, Security, and Stewardship. And I might mention, uh, without doubt, the best, best jewel ever given to Homeland Security, uh, in our, my opinion, and in the ranking member's opinion. Pursuant to the rules of this committee, would you all please rise to take the oath? Raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate that all, please have a seat. All witnesses answered in the affirmative. Now, my, my predecessor, whose face is, and portrait is up there, Mr. Towns, began a tradition of explaining the obvious, but he did it every time, and I appreciated it. Your entire opening statements will be placed in the record. In front of you, you have a, a countdown clock, uh, and like so many things that you, uh, uh, you look at, you say, does it really matter? The answer is, please summarize if you run out of time. Uh, we'd like to get through all of you and get you out of here with full questions and answers in a timely fashion. And remember, your opening statements will be available in their alternity, uh, uh, in their entirety. I'm sorry. Mr. McLaughlin, you're first. You have five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman, uh, Chairman Issa and, ranking and distinguished members of the committees. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. TSA has made significant strides in our deployment and utilization of AIT over the past year. Automatic target recognition software recently installed in the majority of our machines enhanced privacy by eliminating passenger specific while improving throughput capabilities and streamlining the checkpoint screening process. In the fall of 2011, my office and to further develop operational performance targets, including new AIT utilization control that can with the DHS, OIG, and GAO recommendations. Tied to this, we implemented an action plan to increase AIT utilization across the nation. As a result of these efforts, our utilization performance between February 2011 and February 2012 improved by 200 percent. In addition, we're employing VPS technology to automatically verify documents. CAT PSS will replace the current procedure to detect fraudulent documents. We will deploy this technology for airports. Technology is only one mechanism. The uses behavior observation analysis to identify potential high-risk individuals who may pose a threat to security. SPOT was scientifically in and technology division, representing the 
thorough analysis of any behavior related. No other counter or cybersecurity program is known to have systematic evaluation. A bit active at identifying than random screening protocols. That TSC continues work the research to increase Under a new pilot, employee especially should be referred for additional This additional use the security agencies better behavior and anomalies. Preliminary analysis is an increase in the rate and TSA is currently conducting an analysis a validation process for future roles. Completing these programs, TSA has begun teaching a tactical, I'm sorry, complementing these program de de developments, TSA has begun teaching a tactical communications course for our frontline workforce. This training focuses on active listening, empathy, and verbal communication techniques and will be complete by the end of 2012. These initiatives are some of the key aspects of TSA's security infrastructure that provide the backbone for our overall risk-based strategy. This strategy demonstrates our commitment to move away from a one-size-fits-all security model. While this approach was necessary after 9-11 and has been effective over the past decade, key enablers now allow TSA to move toward a more intuitive solution. Perhaps the most widely known RBS initiative is TSA PreCheck. To date, approximately 600,000 passengers have experienced an expedited screening through TSA PreCheck. By the end of 2012, we expect to officer passengers in 35 of our nation's busiest airports the benefits of TSA PreCheck. In addition to eligible frequent flyers and members of CBP's trusted traveler programs, we just expanded PreCheck to include active duty U.S. military traveling out of Reagan National Airport. In addition to PreCheck, last fall we implemented new screening procedures for children 12 and under allowing them to leave their shoes on and go through a less, less intrusive security screening process. And just last Monday, at a few airports, we began testing similar modified procedures for passengers 75 and older. Finally, we are also supporting efforts to test identity-based screening for airline pilots. So far, over 470,000 uniformed pilots have cleared security through the known crew member program. These initiatives have allowed us to expedite the screening process for children, our military, many frequent flyers, and now in testing the elderly. They have resulted in fewer divestiture requirements and a significant reduction in pat-downs, while allowing us more time to focus on travelers we believe are likely to pose a risk to our transportation network, including those on terrorist watch lists. By enhancing the effectiveness of our current programs and layering in our risk-based security initiatives, TSA continues to work toward our goal of providing the most effective security in the most efficient way. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. At this time, I would like to introduce my colleague, Mr. Stephen Sadler, Assistant Administrator for TSA's Office of Intelligence and Analysis. The gentleman is recognized. Good afternoon, Chairman Eisen and distinguished members of the committees. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on some of the work we are doing in coordination with the United States Coast Guard to strengthen security throughout our nation's maritime transportation system. The Transportation Worker Identification Credential Program, or TWIC, is an important security measure designed to ensure that individuals who pose a threat to security do not gain unescorted access to secure areas of certain maritime facilities and vessels. Prior to the TWIC program, there was no standard identity verification or background check policy for entrance to a port. Today, facility owners and operators can look for one standard identification document issued after the successful completion of a thorough security threat assessment. The identity verification and threat assessment requirements of the TWIC program support the DHS multilayered approach to protecting the nation's transportation system and enhance security at our ports. Several key objectives included in the Safe Port Act of 2006 were met during the initial rollout of the program in October 2007. These include milestones for implementing TWIC enrollment sites, conducting security threat assessments, and issuing TWICs. On April 15, 2009, U.S. Coast Guard regulation implemented the requirement for all unescorted workers in secure areas and all mariners to possess a valid TWIC. 
As of this month, almost 2 million transportation workers, including longshoremen, truckers, and port employees have received the TWIC. This past February, TSA deployed changes to allow TWIC holders to receive comparability for the security threat assessment when applying for a hazardous materials endorsement on their state issued commercial driver's license. Under comparability, hazmat applicants with a valid TWIC can pay a reduced fee and do not need to go to an enrollment center. They can go directly to their state licensing agency to apply for this endorsement. Currently, 11 States and the District of Columbia have availed themselves of this capability. TSA also recently awarded its Universal Enrollment Services contract. This new capability will allow individuals to apply for multiple programs such as TWIC and HME at the same location, provide enrollment centers across a broader geographic range, and allow enrollment for new or future programs serviced by TSA. On May 31, 2011, TSA completed the required data collection phase of the TWIC reader pilot. TSA gathered information from seven ports, 13 facilities, and four vessel operations that collectively installed 156 readers of various types and models best suited to their business needs. These sites provided data regarding reader performance and reliability, as well as throughput data, vehicle and pedestrian access points. The final report was submitted to Congress February 27, 2012. This data provides a clearer picture of the likely impacts of using readers at maritime facilities and on vessel operations. The TWIC reader pilot concludes that TWIC reader systems function properly when they are designed, installed, and operated in a manner consistent with the characteristics and business needs of the facility or the vessel operation. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Lord. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and other members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me here today to discuss TSA's progress and related challenges in deploying three key security programs. My observations are based on a large body of work that GAO has completed over the last few years. I would first like to note that DHS and TSA have made some notable achievements since the 9 11 attacks in securing our nation's ports and airports. And as the TSA witnesses noted today, some remaining challenges still exist. The first program I'd like to discuss today is TSA's Behavior Detection Program, also called SPOT. This program consists of over 3,000 behavior detection officers that are deployed to over 160 U.S. airports. Now, this program is a key part of TSA's efforts to focus more attention on dangerous people versus dangerous items, which I support. Our bottom line on the program is, while TSA has taken some steps to validate the science behind the program, much more work remains to fully validate it, establish sound performance metrics, and assess costs and benefits. And as we noted in our prior work, all these additional steps could take several more years to complete. And as we noted in our report on the program, TSA deployed SPOT nationwide before determining whether it had a valid scientific basis. The good news is DHS did complete an initial validation study in April 2011, which concluded that the program was more effective than random screening. However, as the study itself noted, it was not designed to fully answer the very important question of whether you can use behavior detection principles for counterterrorism purposes in the airport environment. A scientific consensus on this issue simply does not exist. Another key report recommendation was to develop better performance measures. The importance of this is underscored by looking at the arrests made under the program. For example, 27 percent of the 300 spot arrests made in 2010 were illegal aliens raising questions about mission focus. The second TSA program I'd like to discuss today is TSA's body scanner program commonly referred to as Advanced Imaging Technology, or AITs. As you know, these scanners were deployed in response to the attempted Christmas Day attack of Northwest Airlines flight. About 640 of these units are now in place at over 160 airports. According to TSA, these machines provide superior benefits over walk-through metal detectors since they are capable of detecting nonmetallic threat objects. Earlier this year, we issued a classified report on AIT. Uh, while most of the uh, details are still classified, TSA agreed to allow us to uh, note some of the details regarding the utilization rates of these units uh, for today's hearing. 
we found that some of these units had been used less than 30 percent of the days since their installation. And the good news is, in response to our report, TSA agreed to take steps to address these low utilization rates. The last program I would like to briefly discuss today is TSA's Maritime Biometric Credential Program, called TWIC. In terms of progress, TSA has now enrolled over 2 million maritime workers in the program. However, our 2011 report identified a number of significant internal control weaknesses in card enrollment, background checking, and use that we believe have limited the security benefits of the program. In fact, these weaknesses may have contributed to the breach of selected U.S. facilities during a covert test we conducted as part of this review. We recommended that DHS and TSA strengthen program controls as well as complete an effectiveness study to clarify the current program's contributions to enhancing maritime security. Uh, TSA, I mean, DHS has established a working group with executive oversight to address our uh, important TWIC report recommendations. We look forward to seeing the results of this uh, committee's work. In closing, TSA has established a number of security layers and programs to thwart potential terrorist attacks. However, our past work has identified a number of ways these efforts could be strengthened to help ensure American taxpayers receive a good return on their considerable investment. I'm hoping that today's hearing can provide some additional insights on how these programs can be strengthened and be made more cost effective. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Admiral. Good afternoon, Chairman Issa and distinguished members of the committees. I am honored to appear before you today to speak about the Coast Guard's role in enforcing compliance of the Transportation Worker Identification Credential, or TWIC, program within the Maritime Transportation System. The TWIC program, as envisioned under Maritime Transportation Security Act, or MITSA, of 2002 and strengthened by the Safe Port Act of 2006, requires that all credentialed merchant mariners and transportation workers seeking unescorted access to secure areas of MITSA regulated facilities and vessels undergo a security check and receive a TWIC. The TWIC is currently required for unescorted access to approximately 2,700 regulatory facilities, 12,000 regulated vessels, and 50 regulated outer continental shelf facilities. While the Transportation Security Administration has primary responsibility for the issuance of TWICs, the Coast Guard has primary responsibility for ensuring compliance with the TWIC regulations. All of the approximately 2,700 maritime facilities impacted by the TWIC regulations are and have been in compliance since the April 15, 2009 implementation date. The Coast Guard continues to conduct both unannounced and announced inspections to ensure compliance. Additionally, the Coast Guard has verified more than 213,000 TWICs through a, through a combination of visual and electronic means. In accordance with the Safe Port Act, a pilot program was conducted by TSA to evaluate the feasibility and technical and operational impacts of implementing a TWIC reader system. Electronic readers add another layer of security associated with the TWIC by providing biometric confirmation of the TWIC holder's identity. TSA's report on the pilot program was delivered to Congress on February 27th, and the Coast Guard is now incorporating the results of the pilot in our rulemaking for electronic readers in the maritime environment. This rulemaking will apply requirements in a risk-based fashion to leverage security benefits and capabilities. Additionally, Section 809 of the Coast Guard Authorization Act of 2010 amended the original TWIC requirements to include only those mariners allowed unescorted access to a secure area designated in a vessel security plan. As elements of the Coast Guard Merchant Mariner credential issuance process relies upon data received through TWIC enrollment, the provision was neither self-executing nor easily implemented. Noting such, the Coast Guard issued a policy letter in December 2011 to remove the requirement to hold a TWIC for mariners currently inactive or those serving on vessels that do not require a vessel security plan. The Coast Guard continues to work towards codification of this change through our rulemaking process. A GAO report on TWIC in May 2011 identified a weakness in verification of TWICs in the field. In response, we issued policy to our field units directing thorough verification of TWICs at checkpoints, highlighting that a quick flash of the TWIC was not acceptable. 
Electronic readers deployed at our units ensure each person attempting to enter a facility is carrying a TWIC, and to date we have uh, implemented over 275 readers to our field units. We continue to work with our DHS partners, and particularly with TSA, as well as state and local agencies, to continue to improve the TWIC program for seafarers and other maritime transportation workers by balancing a steadfast commitment to security while facilitating commerce. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I will be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you. And as earlier announced, we will now recognize the gentleman from Maryland for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today, the Oversight Committee and the Transportation Infrastructure Committee convened to examine measures TSA utilizes to secure our nation's transportation networks. In the realm of aviation security, the TSA must achieve a delicate balance. TSA must be effective in meeting the evolving threats posed by terrorists. We also expect it to be responsive to the needs of the public and the demands of commerce. Since the terrible events of September 11, 20, 2001, several attacks have been attempted against commercial planes, including the attempted bombing on Christmas Day, of day 2009 of Northwest Airlines Flight 253 and the attempted bombing in 2010 of a cargo jet using a bomb disguised as an inkjet cartridge. These incidents demonstrate the constantly evolving threats TSA must counter. TSA's 43,000 transportation security officers must screen more than 2 million passengers every day at our nation's 450 airports. Although the vast majority of passengers pose no risk, these officers must find the equivalent of the needle in the haystack. In response to the Christmas Day bombing attempt, TSA increased its deployment of advanced imaging technology systems to screen passengers for both metallic and nonmetallic threats. More recently, TSA has developed the pre-check program to expedite screening for low-risk travelers, such as members of the military. I welcome TSA's efforts to develop a more intelligent, risk-based approach to transportation security. Recognizing the enormity of the challenge TSA faces as the agency develops new screening techniques, we must ensure that it strikes the appropriate balance between moving too quickly to deploy untested or unreliable technologies or techniques and moving too slowly to address new threats. Today's hearing will also review the transportation work identification credential. When I served as chairman of the Subcommittee on Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation, I convened hearings in 2007 and 2008 to review the rollout of TWIC. And I thank the Coast Guard for joining us today. Unlike many screening techniques TSA uses in the aviation realm, Congress mandated what became the TWIC program and required that this program be funded by fees collected from enrollees. There are now more than 2.1 million enrollees, and by our estimate, these enrollees have paid approximately $280 million to implement this program. To close the security perimeter that TWIC is intended to create, we must finally implement the, the use of readers so that these cards are no longer just expensive flash passes. TSA must also ensure that TWIX are not issued to ineligible applicants. However, we must also view TWIX in the broader maritime security context. TWIX is meant to control landside access to secure areas of U.S. ports and to secure areas of U.S. vessels. There are many risks that, uh, that approach our ports particularly from the water side that TWIC was never intended to address. None of the individuals on the estimated 17 million small boats operating in our waters are required to carry TWICs, and none of the foreign mariners on the more than 9,000 foreign flag vessels calling on U.S. ports carry TWICs. Our first and most critical line of maritime defense, our thin blue line at sea, is the Coast Guard which must defend our coasts, rescue thousands at sea, respond to marine casualties and oil spills, intercept drugs and migrants, and enforce security requirements at 2,500 facilities and on nearly 13,000 vessels regulated by the Maritime Transportation Security Act. This service of 42,000 active duty officers and members do all of this on a budget of less than $10 billion per year less than 2 percent of the DOD's base budget, and they now face additional cuts and the loss of up to 1,000 active duty 
slots in the next year's budget. The Coast Guard does all that we ask of them to do. However, we cannot continue to stretch the service and assume that it will never break or the gaps will, will not open in our maritime security. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back and I want to thank you for your courtesy. I thank the gentleman. We have also been joined by the chairman of the full Transportation Committee, and I now recognize him. First of all, thank you so much, uh, Chairman Issa, uh, and for, to uh, your committee, Government Reform and Oversight. I am honored to uh, uh, co-chair this uh, hearing with you. Sorry, a little bit of a delay um, getting back here today, but uh, pleased to be with you. And I thank you for your uh, leadership on this. This is very important agency that we have res uh, joint responsibility over. Our committee has some limited oversight responsibility uh, under transportation. As, as uh, you may recall, historically, TSA was created. Uh, I happened to chair the subcommittee on aviation in 2001 after the horrific uh, terrorist uh, attacks. Uh, since that time, uh, TSA has grown from 16,500 screeners and a small cadre of different um, transportation security activities which we joined together. Um, it was a much smaller uh, beginning and unfortunately uh, TSA has mushroomed uh, to 65,000 uh, employees of which there are 14,000 administrative personnel, 4,000 in Washington and 10,000 out in the field. Uh, we never intended it to, uh, to uh, mushroom to this size. And as you know, I have been uh, critical particularly of the administrative uh, cost. Uh, even with the administrative cost, you'd, uh, we might be able to uh, endure that kind of expenditure, which has now grown to $8 billion uh, if it meant we were secure. But instead, as this uh, committee report today reviews, we have a number of programs that are so far behind. Uh, one I'll, that I would like to talk about is the TWIC program, Trans Transportation Worker Identification Card. It spent uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. It's, it's still in limbo. Uh, some of the equipment that has been purchased uh, does not do the job. I know we can't talk about all of it here in this uh, open setting, but um, the deployment of expen and acquisition of exp expensive uh, equipment that is supposed to protect us, which wasn't properly t uh, tested, vetted, and the deployment could have probably been done better by uh, a high school uh, class project. Um, TSA has, has had five administrators in nine years. We had a period under the Obama administration in which we had no administrator for uh, almost a year. It is difficult enough with an agency uh, like TSA or any other Federal agency to operate with an administrator in Washington, let alone not having an administrator for uh, that period of time. Uh, I have other concerns um, having monitored this as closely as anyone in Congress. Uh, we are still at risk. The nation is still at risk. Uh, unfortunately, even the uh, layered system, and TSA will talk to you about a layered system, uh, almost every layer is just uh, flawed. Uh, the behavior detection, which I worked with previous administrators to put in when we had equipment that didn't work, uh, TSA again bought equipment that didn't work. Uh, just following that equipment, the puffers, uh, and I've had my investigative staff follow that. Uh, they they have sat and uh, they sat and uh, we were paying rent on them on a vacant, uh, I'm sorry, in a warehouse. Um, that uh, then they uh, spent $600, I think, per piece of equipment. They told us the DoD uh, had them destroyed, uh, but only after we prompted the action. Sent investigators down to look at another. Jointly, we sent them down to look at another warehouse. We got information that was full of equipment. Uh, some of it purchased, some of it should have been deployed, some of it sitting there at, ta at great taxpayer expense uh, for a long time paying a rent on it. And then the nerve to uh, cause us to delay, and I might even ask if we can't get the information to subpoena it, uh, when, our, when we were uh, informing 
TSA that we were sending our investigative staff there to delay our staff and investigation by a week so trucks could come up and haul the stuff away, even some of it as we were, uh, as our investigators were appearing on the scene. It is just a, a very expensive uh, uh, and disappointing uh, operation. I have uh, had faith in Administrator Pistol. He promised reform. Uh, he's told the committee he would reform uh, the agency, and I don't see that happening, unfortunately. But that's just the highlights, uh, Mr. Chairman, and um, it's it's just uh, uh, important that we get to the bottom of this. There's a lot of hard-earned taxpayer money going for, uh, unfortunately, theater security and uh, not real security, and we're We've got to stop paying that price before we pay a huge price with another attack, successful attack uh, by terrorists. Yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes. I have the advantage of knowing your bios. You may not know mine, but I spent nearly three decades in security. And the one thing I know about security is there are two types. There is a type that convince people that your target is harder than somebody else's. In other words, I can't protect all cars, but I can make the crook choose to steal the car next to the one protected by Viper. That is what I would say you have as a system here today. You, in fact, have a series of hardenings. They work sometimes, and I am speaking particularly about the, in the aviation. These programs certainly seem to be good programs. And in every case, as the wind blows through the screen, those spots clearly will at times stop targets. But targets, particularly terrorist targets, are in fact exactly like you would expect. They are mobile. They are responsive. If we do not have a layered security system that has a sufficient force to at least be like the hull of a ship, Admiral, one in which we know there will be a few leaks that you have to pump out, but for the most part, it is watertight. Our security system today is clearly not watertight. The accidental catching of, of the bad guys belabors two points. One, the many people who, in fact, find themselves, like most of us on the dais, going through security, and sometimes they have us pull something out, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they do a secondary, sometimes they don't. I am going to give you just a couple. We opened up this hearing to Facebook. I am just giving you anecdotal ones, but I will supply all of them. I will place them in the record, and I will also supply all of them to you so you can respond to the individuals in their entirety. But, for example, Joe Correa, or Correa, he is a U.S. Marine. He was flying in his dress blue D uniform. He was forced to remove his trousers in full view of passengers because his shirt stays beneath them were scaring a TSA employee. It didn't matter that he explained what it was, and it didn't matter that they were something that he undoubtedly had seen many times before if he were a veteran. Of course, you and I all know that the turnover at TSA is high and the training is, is, is seemingly perpetual. The next one is from Reagan Shea, who says, I am, a, I am a disabled person and have been targeted for groping. My wife travels with a portable oxygen uh, concentrator, and her use of the machine means she gets pawed by hand every time we travel. Julia Rochelle, the TSA has taken away my freedom to travel because I wear a medical device and cannot go through the amount of radiation I would be subjected to. As a result, I get an enhanced pat-down procedure every time. Lastly, and there are plenty more, there are over 350, I am Wendy. I wear, I have worn an artificial leg since I was four. I am now 61. I used to travel a lot for my work, but gave up uh, traveling after being assaulted by TSA constantly, even to, even to the point of having my breasts checked instead of my leg prosthesis. The first question I have for the panel, and particularly for the aviation side, 
there are 65 to 67,000 TSA workers, men and women who are trying to do the good job. A quarter of them are employed in administration. First question for you is, do you think that is a fair ratio of administration, or do you think you are, in fact, a bloated bureaucratic organization that has a lot of people working on a lot of systems that ultimately, after procurement, don't work? Mr. McLaughlin. Sir, I will respond to that. First of all, thank you for recognizing the very hardworking men and women of TSA. Our folks in the field are working hard every day uh, to keep all of us safe as, as we travel. Um, I will have to take for the record the, the ratio for uh, administrative to frontline personnel. Um, I, I think it might be different from that, but I will get back to well, you. I will give you one. When I travel, obviously, uh, to a number of places, Houston, Sacramento, but San Diego and Dulles are my two majors. I can tell you that I periodically count, and for four active checkpoints in San Diego, there will be as many as 35 people in blue standing there. So even if your administrative count were not one in four, wouldn't you agree, based on your own observations, that the amount of people directly at a, check, a checkpoint versus the total number would seem to be extremely high? In other words, you haven't created any efficiency in the 10 years of your existence. Well, certainly I, I don't agree with that. TSA is working hard to provide the most effective Well, let's go through the, the numbers, though. Way quickly, because my time, I am really on overtime, and I will make it up to the ranking member. There are four times as many TSA employees as there was uh, seven or eight years ago, correct? Again, I, I don't believe 2002, 16,000 in your initial authorization, so you had less than that. By 2005, you were still below 35,000. You are now over 65,000. In the last, let's say, five years, when you have more than doubled in numbers, have the American people seen shorter lines, yes or no? I do believe that American people have seen shorter lines in the last four or five years. Yeah. Well, with that, I would like you to check your figures. The fact is they haven't seen shorter lines. I fly to enough airports to tell you that, in fact, you are not giving shorter lines. You are, in, you are taking longer for each one and using more people. With that, I would recognize the uh, ranking member uh, for his opening his questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, TSA recently completed the reader pilot test required by Safe Port Act. As I mentioned in my uh, opening statement, I believe that to maximize the security TWIC can provide, we must move to implement the use of the readers. Assistant uh, Secretary Sadler, TSA was responsible for the recent reader pilot test, and Admiral Zunkoff, the am I pronouncing it right? Okay. The Coast Guard is responsible for promulgating the final reader rule. Let me ask both of you this. Will it be technically feasible for facilities to install readers that can quickly and reliably read TWIC cards without impeding the flow of workers into ports, into the secure areas of vessels, and by what date do you think the installation of the readers can realistically be, realistically be achieved? And I think we've been, it seems like we ought to be able to get this done, gentlemen, some kind of way. We've been uh, messing around with it for a while. Oh, come on, some of you. What are you, I'll Admiral? Be, uh, ranking member, I'd be pleased to answer that. Uh, as you know, we are we have embarked upon the rulemaking process, uh, getting to a final rule. Uh, before we do that, we really need to adjudicate the comments. So uh, that will be very informative to answer that very question, uh, with the objective of not impeding commerce. Uh, there are over 32 recognized commercial off-the-shelf uh, TWIC readers. Um, we expect one of the concerns will be um, you know, whether you use a mobile system or whether it is a, a fixed uh, system that would be at a container terminal. Uh, but we would envision uh, approximately a two-year period of time uh, from the time a final rule uh, was on the street to full implementation uh, across industry. Mr. Sadler, do you have a response? Yes. I think, uh, sir, during the pilot we did show that when the, the readers were installed properly, the people uh, who worked in the facilities were trained properly, and the workers uh, were assimilated to the cards and the use of the cards with those readers, uh, that they did work properly. They did not impede the uh, flow of commerce in those particular ports. But it does depend on the installation. It does depend on the uh, training. And it does depend on whether the facility has picked the right reader for its business need. Now, Admiral Zenkov, the GAO reported that its uh, employees were successful in accessing ports using counterfeit TWIX, authentic TWIX acquired 
through fraudulent means and false business cases. Let me ask you this. I want, to, I want you to clarify that an individual ports still have the authority and, indeed, the responsibility to deny admission even to those who have valid and authentic Twix if they have no business on the port property. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. And that said, what steps has the uh, Coast Guard taken to address the GAO's findings? And additionally, do you think the use of readers will help uh, close these security gaps? Uh, uh, ranking member, I do. Uh, we have uh, issued policy guidance to our field units. Uh, to date, they have been out in the field uh, screening, uh, doing spot checks. We have done over 200,000 of these spot checks uh, in, in a two-day period alone last week. Uh, we ran over 450 spot checks, and out of those 450, uh, we did find 58 uh, members who had no rightful business uh, doing uh, being at those particular facilities. We engage extensively with our stakeholders through our area uh, security committees and certainly the facility owners. Uh, they are interested, first of all, in, in those who may have criminal intent, which is uh, one of the, the slices of information that TWIC provides. And, and on a steady basis, uh, those, that pool of 2 million TWIC card, card holders uh, are being screened against the terrorist screening database. So there is real-time information, but also a benefit to the facility owners as well. Now, TWIC is the only uh, part of our maritime security regime, uh, that, that, and, that, and that's very significant. The Coast Guard is and will remain the most important element of that regime, but the strains of budget cuts on the service are obvious. For example, in 2010, 10 of the 12 cutters deployed to respond to the earthquake in Haiti suffered significant problems and two had to be taken out of service and sent in for major repairs. Is that right? Uh, I, I was intimately involved with that response, uh, Ranking Member, and that is true. And in February of this year, the GAO issued a new report of finding that in part due to a lack of funding, the Coast Guard does not have any fully operating interagency operating centers through these, uh, though these were required by the Safe Port Act to be established by October 2009. Similarly, the GAO the DHS Inspector General and others have noted the Coast Guard's inability to meet safety and security mission requirements uh, in the Arctic as the ice cover opens to allow more shipping operations in those latitudes. Nonetheless, the President's budget uh, proposes extensive cuts both to the Coast Guard's uh, end strength and its capital account. No funding was requested for the acquisition of the National Security Cutters 7 or 8, and this budget will uh, conclude the acquisition of the fast response cutter at a number substantially below the approved uh, program uh, of record. Finally, this is my last question. While I know that the Coast Guard strives to meet every mission requirement, can you comment on the challenges the service is facing in balancing its competing mission needs, particularly in the maritime security arena, in light of the significant budget constraints? And, you know, I have always complained about the Coast Guard not having enough money. I am just trying to figure out how you are going to do all the things you've got to do, particularly since 9-11, uh, with regard to the budget cuts. Uh, I would be pleased to, Ranking Member Cummings. Uh, I was involved in the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. I was the Federal on-scene coordinator for over seven months, um, and the President directed that we triple our response effort. Um, the Coast Guard has no force in garrison. We are constantly doing frontline operations, and so we, we had the good fortune, if you want to call it that, um, where we didn't have another contingency occurring at the same time as Deepwater Horizon. So I was able to redeploy buoy tenders from Cordova, Alaska to Honolulu uh, and marshal all of those resources into the Gulf of Mexico. We were able to do the same during the earthquake in Haiti, even though some of those ships uh, did have maintenance uh, challenges, and we did the same during uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, so the challenge we face in the maritime security domain is what if we have multiple threats? Uh, what if we have a hurricane and then we have a, a, a threat to national security uh, taking place concurrently? And, and that's where we really run into resource challenges, because we have to reallocate resources from one mission to another. Uh, and we are at risk because we don't have the resources to do both. Thank the gentleman. We now recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Miker, for five minutes. <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, to my friends at T TSA and other witnesses, uh, since my last uh, uh, hearing, um, which was with the Appropriations Subcommittee, I was uh, uh, not a member. Am not a member of that 
subcommittee, but was allowed to ask questions as we have extended to others who were not on our uh, committee. And um, we, we recommend that system to all committees. Well, and yes, and <laughs> the funny thing about that is, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I'll, this won't, I won't allow this to take away from my time, but I have to put this caveat in. Um, TSA found out that I would be a witness, so they sent Mr. Pistol a, uh, an email. And the email said when Mr. Micah, Mr. Mike is going to be there, so when he asks the question, uh, Mr. Pistol, uh, take a long time answering it so you eat up his time. The problem is that they, uh, again, sometimes you think it's the gang that can't shoot straight, but uh, they shot the email to CQ. Is that, I think that was the, the, the publication. So, um, to, again, uh, reserving my time, uh, uh, if you would answer fairly briefly and not use the directive of that memo. Um, one of my concerns, of course, is the uh, transportation worker identification card. Uh, we spent over a half a billion dollars. Is that correct? Yes or no, Mr. McLaughlin? Uh, Mr. Yeah, I'll take that one, sir. Uh, to I date, have 511 million spent. Uh, to date, on the program itself, uh, we've expended approximately 374 million dollars. I have 511 you, million. You, you may be including uh, grants in that. I'd have to go back and check well, that number. Well, we wouldn't want to leave any. I mean, it, it consider that as an expenditure money spent. All right. Uh, well, we'll say in the neighborhood of a half a billion. Um, and the card is supposed to allow us to identify who goes into our, our ports. Um, we passed the law uh, set, setting that requirement up uh, back uh, after 2001, right? Mr. Sadler, who wants to answer? That was, uh, I believe that was required by the uh, MITS of 2002. 2002, after 2001, thank you. Uh, they've produced 1.9 million of the cards uh, are active, uh, printed 2.1 million of them. Uh, we still do not have all of the components that were, re were required under the law, including uh, iris uh, and thumbprint as far as biometric capability. Do we, Mr. Settler? Uh, we have the capability to include an iris on but, the uh, chip of the card. But we do not have uh, a standard for iris, right? That's correct. NIST has just put out a, a proposed change to their uh, standard to again, include IRS. Again, I just have to go back because this is not going to be Groundhog Day, but I had a hearing uh, April 14th, almost a year ago, um, and we had in the uh, head of, uh, well, the director of the NHTSA Information Technology Lab testified, uh, and I have the questions here, when will you finish the IRIS capability draft? publication will be, this is uh, last year, hopefully before next week, and when will you finish the final standard? By the end of the year. That was last year. Now, I was told at the beginning of the, the year it might be, what, this summer? Is that what you've heard? Uh, no, sir. I haven't gotten a time for when they... Uh, so you don't have they... a time. They told us this summer. So we're now going into our ninth year. Now, it's great that we publish or that we produce these uh, uh, Twit cards, a great public expense, a half a billion. But um, then I read that you're still in, uh, you're still in a pilot re reader program. So basically, we have 1. Point million of these cards, and we don't have readers. Is that correct? Well, just Do to the go, ports just have to go, readers? Just to go back a second, the there is a fingerprint readers? template on the chip of the, the card. Do the ports have readers? Certain ports do have readers, and we have 35 readers we have that are on an approved products list yeah. that the how ports many, can how use. How many of the ports would have readers, and how many of these cards are able to be read? A well, we, percentage. we know that the uh, pilot ports have readers. I don't know the number of ports outside of the pilot ports that have readers. So I do we know the Coast Guard the record has. record at this time the uh, short number of, uh, or the very uh, small number of uh, ports that, in fact, have readers. And we don't do Without that. objection, so ordered. Thank you. Um,
behavior detection. Let me go into this, and I'm just going to take one more minute because I had to. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, behavior technician program. We've spent a billion dollars on it. Can someone can someone uh, say that that's correct? We, Sir, I believe that number is slightly below that, uh, but we will get back to you for the okay. record. All right. And I also I asked uh, when when I knew that the puffers didn't work that they had bought and told me that they would work and actually went to ha uh, up and had them tested. Went through every time. It didn't detect uh, some trace elements that were put on me. I was told it was just a technical problem, that, and we just destroyed those. Uh, is that correct? Uh, we paid $600 a piece for the, to destroy the puffers. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. Yeah, okay. And they said, I don't even want to know how long they sat in the wa warehouse, uh, and then they had DOD destroyed. But uh, getting something else in place because the technology didn't work. And you, you all have seen the classified reports on the performance of the advanced imaging technology equipment, have you not? Yes. Yes, okay. So we, we know by that performance and uh, the lack of performance of uh, what we've seen with the puffers that behavior detection is very important and others use it successfully. The problem is um, GAO reviewed uh, the performance and said that 24 times 17 known terrorists went through uh, airports past TSA and they have yet to detect one uh, terrorist. And that was actually a question that was submitted by uh, one of the Floridians. We had an uh, open question uh, online that we allowed people. Uh, can you name a, uh, any terrorists that you've actually stopped? in the program? We are not aware of any terrorists uh, transiting a checkpoint where BDOs were actively working. While we accept GAO's comment that there were 24 instances in spot airports, we do not know that BDOs were working at the time that those individuals came through, number one. And number two, we know in hindsight that they were not operational, so they were not exhibiting signs of stress, fear, or deception. Could I comment on that? Uh, uh, yes, the gentleman's time has expired. I, uh, I'm the uh, GAO representative. I think our point in the report was to study the travel patterns of people associated with terrorists to see if they were exhibiting any spot behaviors. At this time, I don't believe it's known whether they were exhibiting behaviors or not. And we made that recommendation in the spirit of improving the program to develop better performance measures. We suggested reviewing the uh, videotapes. We thought that would be a rich source of information to help refine the program. So At this point, point, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I will also ask unanimous consent to put in the record, we went up and looked in Boston of where they have um, a uh, demonstration project, and I think there is still one in Detroit. And we saw um, uh, unbelievable uh, Without objection, configuration, so and we want to detail our findings, which we also passed on to the administration. Without objection, that will be placed in the record. And I now go to uh, Mr. Boswell, a gentleman who I served with on the Select Intelligence Committee, who more than probably anybody here on the dais today knows what the special skills are necessary to read somebody who may be a terrorist. Without a, and the gentleman is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You may have overstated that a little bit, but nevertheless. No, I, re I remember our times behind closed doors very, very well, and you were truly the senior statesman there on that issue. Well, you're very kind. I appreciate it. And uh, <clears throat> well, first off, I want to start off with a positive remark. I uh, we stood up at what we do, uh, Mr. Chairman, is going to be a pretty humongous uh, agency as we started out with the uh, the need we had and situation that caused it. And I'd like to compliment the courtesy and, uh, and efforts that uh, people starting new careers, if you will, uh, have demonstrated. The, the one thing that amazes me, and I, it's not rocket science, I've been waiting and waiting and waiting. I was really pleased to see that we realized we could push the air crews through a little quicker and not delay things. There's a number of us here, myself included, that uh, held uh, probably as high a clearance as one can get for years, but it, I still am checked as if I suspect I'm uh, coming through the same airport time and time and time and time and time again. Uh, 
I know there's some people that uh, have a, a, a malady because of things happening in the service. And there seems to be no effort to recognize that they, my gosh, they've had a background check, a top secret, top secret crypto, so on and so on. Do you have any intention to ever trying to take advantage of that and expedite things a little bit, or are you just going to keep on doing it like you've been doing it? Yeah, sir, actually, the answer to that question is we're, we're actively engaged with a number of uh, different groups to try to expand our pre-check population. Again, pre-check is the program that is allowing expedited screening for individuals that are qualified either today in pilot phase because they're um, part of a frequent flyer program or they've opted in through CBP's global entry. We extended the program to active duty military traveling out of uh, Reagan National Airport. That started last week. And we're exploring um, other groups that we can work with. Well, I understand the active the military. And, you know, if people like Mr. Isa and myself and others, you know, took off the uniform one day and didn't wear it the next. But the history is still there. So, so we, we are actively looking at that. Our, our goal as we what, move forward. What do you put your timeline for active on this? seems like just simple, straightforward. The record either is there or it's not. And in the case that I know of, at least I can speak for myself, I know the record's there. There are two aspects, really, that we focus on. One is, to your point, if the record is there, and then two is our ability to reconcile that at the checkpoint. So there's a technology piece that allows us to verify that someone is, you know, who they, they, we believe they are. Um, we started this process in the fall of last year, and already in just uh, March, we're up over 600,000 participants in the program. So I think we're working quickly to expand the program, but we're doing it also cautiously to make sure that we're maintaining security at every step along the way. Well, I appreciate that, but I still I just don't, I don't understand why you can't take, when it's like discovering the wheel all over or doing, passing up the fact that we've spent a lot of money in the past on doing background checks on a number of people, and it's just like it never happened. And how many years have been going on now? We've been doing this, and it seems like you've had time to proceed a little bit further along the way. But again, I want to leave stop on a positive note. I think that the personnel are courteous, work hard, and are sincere, and are following the rules that their administrators give them to operate by. I just think we could do it a little bit better. I do appreciate the fact that we don't have to leave pilots and an air crew standing in line as we did for some time, but I thought that would probably get solved, but uh, we're leaving a lot of other people, which takes up time, clogs up the process when it be a pretty simple identification. You know, most of us that have spent uh, time in the service have got a, even got a printed ID card that says we served 20 plus years and a lot of information on there. It seems like it can be used. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. I see that uh, I'm up next, so I'll uh, yield myself five minutes. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank you all, all for taking the opportunity to be here. I think I'm in the unique position of uh, being the one member of Congress who actually serves on all three committees that has jurisdiction over the, uh, the TSA, the Government Oversight Reform Committee, the Transportation Committee, and the Homeland Security. So I actually spend a whole lot of time with this uh, issue as well as quite a bit of time uh, traveling and experience in the service of the TSA. And I would like to say the vast majority, uh, and I would say almost uh, without exception, but there are exceptions, uh, the TSA employees that I have encountered in my travels have all been um, courteous and professional in nature. However, as part of preparing for this, uh, just like Chairman Issa, I opened up my social media sites to comments with respect to the uh, social, with respect to experiences with the social, with the TSA, and I received quite a few uh, negative comments as well, and without objection, I'd like to get those entered into the record as well. Uh, so ordered. Um, I do want to talk about some of the problems that people have reported with the TSA. And I understand we're in a situation where it's a stressful environment for many people traveling. The TSA is squeezed into spaces in airports not designed for the level of uh, screening. But if you look at some of these instances, and we had one in the news just last, uh, just last week of the gentleman uh, in the wheelchair. Uh, being patted. It, it seems like at some point if we could just use some common sense and slow down a little bit uh, and you know, offer to do some of these screenings in a, 
in a private area or in, in a screened off area. And maybe it is worth spending a little uh, effort on creating spaces that are uh, more friendly to that. We might, uh, might be able to, to do better there. I just, I just encourage uh, both the TSA and the traveling public not to, not to get worked up, because you know, I think there are some better ways to do this. I did want to talk a little bit about the SPOT program. And I am concerned at uh, how effective a, a behavioral detection program is with the limited amount of interaction there is between the TSA agents and the general public. About six months ago, I think I commented in one of these hearings that I could get through the entire airport without uttering a word other than thank you uh, to anybody, check in at a kiosk, hand my stuff to the TSA, hand my stuff to the gate agent. Now at least the TSA is asking me for my full name. Uh, it seems like there, uh, SPOT would be better off if there was a little bit more engagement. Uh, could, Mr. Loeffler and Mr. Sadler, would you all uh, like to comment on that? Yes, thank you. And, and first, if I could, uh, just for everyone's awareness, so every passenger that travels through a checkpoint is entitled to private screening upon request. So we want to make sure that we honor that commitment. To it might be something you consider offering, uh, especially to the elderly and disabled and children. Sure. And, and with regard to the video from last week, that was actually a video that was over two years old. And with the policy changes that we put in place last fall, again, we have seen a dramatic decline in the number of times where we have had to right. pat down children and now the elderly with our new program. With regard to SPOT and your question, sir, um, I agree with you that our SPOT program in its current uh, form is largely an observation program where our officers are trained to observe signs of, um, of fear, of uh, deception, and of stress that are different than the general traveling. And, and Mr. Lord, there is no way to really test that because you, you can't imitate those behaviors. That, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. It's very, uh, as in any uh, deterrence program, it's very difficult to and evaluate it from a. Thank you. I, I apologize. I'm going quickly because of time. Um, what is the uh, rollout schedule nationwide for TSA pre? I dusted off my global entry card because I'm looking real forward to uh, being able to use that. Yeah. So we have uh, the administrator and the secretary announced in uh, early, I think, in February that we intend to roll out to the 35 busiest airports uh, by the end of this calendar year, and so far we're on target uh, for that. As of last week, we're at 11 airports, and we continue to roll out. A couple airports a week, and we'll begin adding additional airlines as well. All right, and uh, Mr. Lord, I know you spent a fair amount of time uh, studying what uh, what the TSA does, and uh, I've also had uh, access to uh, some of these uh, classified reports to the level that I'm a little bit concerned. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask you: Do you see some things that we are not doing that we should be doing to uh, to increase security? Is that, I know that really isn't something specifically you study, but you all spent a lot of time. Uh, looking at what they are doing and how? I can't think of anything at the top of my head. We have uh, completed a large body of work on various layers of TSA security programs. Um, all of our reports include recommendations to improve things. So we think we are having a positive uh, impact on the programs. And TSA has been very receptive to uh, most of our recommendations. Uh, I see I am out of time. Hopefully, we will we'll, we'll get to a second round of questions. I uh, will now recognize uh, uh, Mr. Conley, the uh, gentleman from Virginia, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. And I, I think we need to start, uh, as, as our colleague Mr. Boswell did, uh, positively recognizing the extraordinary difficulty of the mission here. In a free society, uh, how do we graft onto that? Uh, protective and necessarily often intrusive measures to protect the public after the tragedy of 9-11 especially. Uh, and, and in a democracy, frankly, it seems to me we ought to be arguing about this all the time because I don't think we should ever get complacent uh, about either side of this, my right to privacy and my right to be protected and the role of government in fulfilling that mission. So I think it is a natural tension. Uh, and not necessarily always a reflection on uh, the men and women who are trying to fulfill this mission. Uh, and I, uh, my observation anecdotally is uh, that uh, the men and women who have been recruited to fulfill this mission actually are doing, uh, on balance, a very good job. And many of them are very professional in their approach to the public. But as the chairman indicated and as Mr. Issa indicated, 
uh, our committee chair. Um, there are, however, occasions where that is not the case. And, and one thing I just commend to you, Mr. McLaughlin, and you, Mr. Sadler, a simple training in please and thank you would really go a long way with the public. Um, I, I wish I could say that everybody remembers that, but, you know, we are not cattle, and we are citizens, and we are not to be presumed guilty of anything. And barking orders like people are cattle is not appropriate. And I would urge you strongly to make sure that people made. Uh, I, I know it seems simple, but it gets on the traveling public's nerves, and it undoes a lot of the wonderful work otherwise being done by the employees of TSA. So I, once in a while, there are people just I don't know they, they don't feel they need to do that, or they're they're giving orders. Uh, and what we're really trying to do here in a free society is to get compliance. And, uh, and most of the public, I think, actually understands that and, and is willing to tolerate a fair amount of intrusiveness, uh, uh, more than I would have guessed, actually. But, um, but they do expect to be treated with respect. And so I think so long as we can imbue that in the training of our men and women, I think we would also go a long way to enhancing the compliance, understanding we're all in this together. Mr. Lord, um, last year TSA ranked 232 out of 241 federal agencies uh, and, and entities in the Partnership for Public Services' best places to work. In other words, uh, it was in the bottom 5 percent of federal agencies as, yeah, I'd love to work there. Um, and it ranked second to last for pay, family-friendly management policies, and performance-based incentives. Uh, would you comment? Well, I'm aware of that survey. First, I'd like to uh, comment that GAO is consistently ranked near the top. I believe last year we were second. I saw the scores for DHS and TSA. I think some of that reflects they have a very large screening workforce that has a somewhat stressful job. They're interacting with the public on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, and uh, sometimes that's stressful. It wasn't clear to me, though, what the department was doing about it on an organizational-wide basis, and we have some work underway right now. I'm going to give them an opportunity to comment on that, but are you familiar with the turnover rate last year? Not uh, specifically. Would it surprise you for me to tell you what was 13 percent? If that's accurate, that would not surprise me, no. Uh, and it's been 10 percent for at least the last five years, and that that is significantly higher than the average of federal agencies? Well, any time any organization experiences that type of turnover, obviously you're dealing with uh, some, it imposes certain challenges on Given you. Given the sensitive nature of the mission, the security mission, would it con should it concern us, in your opinion, that we have low morale and high turnover and that that actually could, that in theory could affect the performance of the mission? I'm not sure what the root causes are. That's uh, something. Well, putting aside have, causes, yeah. just those facts, would that not suggest it could compromise the mission? That that we're less than enthusiastic about carrying out the mission, or less than caring about it because I don't even like being here, uh, and I don't like my boss, or I don't like the policies of the agency. Sure. What I'm worried about is, in addition to the men and women who are suffering that low morale, what's the impact on the on the traveling public in terms of their carrying out their mission? Yeah, that, that would concern me as a TSA executive. Mr. Chairman, if you would allow, I won't ask any more, but if you wouldn't mind allowing Mr. McLaughlin and Mr. Sadler to respond to the. Without objection. I thank you, Chair. Thank you. Sir, first of all, to your comment about training, I'm, I'm pleased to uh, let you know that um, earlier this year we began a training initiative that we're referring to as TACCOM. And that initiative is a training that all TSA uh, frontline employees and their managers in the field will go through, uh, which focuses specifically on active listening skills, on empathy, as well as on a communication technique that hopefully will improve that experience. Um, the caveat being that airports are, are very busy in loud places, and sometimes it's just hard uh, to balance the need to communicate um, in a way that's heard without being overheard, so to speak. Uh, with regard to uh, my numbers with regard to attrition or something. If I can different. interrupt you, there's a difference between please put your hands up versus, you know, in the machine versus put your hands up. Uh, and agreed, and that's what this training addresses specifically. Um, again, we are on target to get that training complete for managers and supervisors by June of this year and by, for the entire frontline staff by December of this year. The numbers that I have for attrition are 6.1 percent for full timers and then. Uh, 18 percent for part-timers. So while we are concerned about the part-time number, uh, the overall number that I think you have might be skewed somewhat by that data. 
With regard to what we're doing to improve um, our standing and the best places to work, I mean, I can tell you from personal experience, uh, first of all, being an employer in both the private sector and now in, in federal service, um, having worked with uh, you know, thousands and thousands of employees, um, I will tell you that I'm very proud of the dedication of my workforce and their commitment to the mission. Um, I think overall uh, their focus on the mission is not consistent with the rating that uh, we received in the best places to work. That being said, we've got a number of initiatives as we move forward to improve the overall morale. Uh, we have national advisory councils. Uh, we have trainings like the ones that I, um, that I described where feedback from officers are things like literally one officer described it as a life-changing event for her in terms of her understanding of her role and how she could, um, how she could um, interact better with customers, which has an impact on morale. And then I would also say that some of it just comes with the newness of our agency. An agency that's less than 10 years old or just now 10 years old is going to have a different growth curve than a federal agency that's been around for 50 or 100 or, or even 200 years. Thank you very much. We'll uh, now proceed to another uh, expert in the field, the uh, gentleman from Minnesota, former airline pilot himself, uh, recognize Mr. Kravak for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Expert? I don't know about that. End user? Yes, definitely. I uh, just have a couple questions, and I thank everybody for coming here today because I think that everybody wants the same mission, they want safety of the air, uh, and get our people, ha make sure our people that are working with us are happy and uh, do their job efficiently and effectively, and thank you for the Coast Guard and all the things that your men and women do for you, Admiral. Uh, just like to talk a, just about a couple things. Joe, I'm um, passenger walking through my first level of security. I'm going to go through SPOT. I see SPOT developing probably into something more of what we're seeing in Amsterdam, um, Israeli, Israel, uh, going to more proactive uh, challenge reply, uh, taking a look at behavior. So I, I see that developing. Right now, it's, really, it, it's not a totally effective tool, but uh, let's just deal with it now, for if we may. So we, we uh, hit SPOT as we head on uh, to, our, to, the, uh, to the screening area. Go to the screening area, and Mr. Lord, you said 30 percent are used by AI, AIT machines. Is that correct? 30 percent of the passengers going through? It's, uh, yeah, according to Mr. McLaughlin, that's correct. Yes. Okay. All right, so 30 percent of the passengers are going through the newer, more improved AIT machines. And would you consider, uh, as much as you can within this arena, are the uh, AITs uh, 100 uh, percent absolute? Are they foolproof? I can't uh, discuss any of the details, okay. but in general, any technology has limitations. Right. We all have limitations. Any uh, technology is going to have some type of, type of limitations. Now, of course, through the metal detectors, uh, those are a little bit less uh, advantageous. Uh, so uh, only 30 percent of those people have gone, have, uh, we'll say, have, they've gone through the first phase of SPOT. Now we're going through 30 percent. We'll even say they go through an AIT machine where the other 70 percent have gone through metal detectors, which are, are, are basically um, less, uh, I want to say less safe, but uh, not, not, as, not as good as the AIT machines. Okay, then we get to the gate, and of course we got the gate agent making sure you get on the right aircraft and everything. So we, we've, leveled, we've gone through some security here, but there is a possibility that something could have slipped through. All right, let's talk about the aircraft itself. The aircraft is sitting on the tarmac, and around the aircraft, we have nearly uh, at nearly a million airport workers that are working around that aircraft, are credentialed. These uh, credentialed airport workers uh, have direct, direct access to non-public areas and, and sanitized areas, um, CIDAs. So uh, here they're working in the shadow of the airplane, these uh, close to a, a million workers. Could you tell me how these workers, these million workers, are credentialed? There's a, uh, they all are required to wear a secure identification display uh, badges, and they're essentially vetted against terrorist watch lists, immigration databases, and criminal records. Well, we've all seen most recently through all the, uh, we've seen drugs being smuggled on board aircraft. We've seen uh, numerous uh, theft rings that have been working in and around the aircraft. And it would be safe to say that there are also holes within this program as well. Would you be, would you be correct on that? There's uh, various vulnerabilities in the layers based on the work we completed today. Okay. Yes. So we have a potential going to the aircraft, some uh, passengers being screened, even uh, having a very good possibility of getting through spot 
and also uh, screening techniques. And we have just as equal opportunity for um, the potential of, uh, of items being given, put on board the aircraft outside, on the shadow of the aircraft through credentialed workers. So my question to you, and I'm going to give you a very good one, Mr. McLaughlin, if you don't mind, sir. And I say this with all due respect. So with the potential of having a person that has malintent coming on board the aircraft, linking up with a device that is on board the aircraft through a credentialed person in the shadow of that aircraft, that aircraft gets underway and is in the air, what are the line of defenses capable in the air at that time? Who is the last line of defense, Mr. McLaughlin? And don't say the cockpit door, <laughs> the armed cockpit door. That wasn't my answer. Of course, with the multiple layers in place, um, there, there are on a number of flights, we do have federal air marshals. Uh, but the layer of security that is in place, that is an important layer today, and we talk about it um, uh, from time to time, and we know it when we fly, is the actual passenger, uh, that individual that learned as many lessons on 9-11 as the rest of us have learned. True. No true words are spoken, if I may have indulged this, Mr. Chair. But if a, person, a professional terrorist has done this routine a hundred times, they know when that cockpit door is going to be open. They know when it's going to be closed. They know a lot of things about the aircraft that your average traveling public does not know. So my, my question to you, sir, is there's, not very, there's not really not that many FAMs available per flight. We ought, that's a classified number. But why, why in God's green earth would we cut in half a volunteer program that protects the aircraft for $15 a flight? Why would we do that? So I can't really uh, discuss that topic because it's, it's really outside of my area of responsibility at TSA. Um, I, I can reinforce some of the other layers that are on the ground, including the work that we do in and around the airport, and we can take that question for the record in terms of... I would appreciate that. This program, the Federal Flight Deck Officer Program, is being cut in half, a $15 per flight program that is the last line of defense for many potential terrorists wishing to take that aircraft and use it as a, uh, weapons of, a weapon of mass destruction. So with that, sir, I would appreciate uh, your information on that. And with that, sir, I, I thank the Chair's indulgence, and I yield back. Thank you very much. We'll now uh, recognize the gentleman from uh, Tennessee, Mr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I'd like to incorporate by, re by reference all the nice things said about TSA personnel, they and, and my home community in Memphis, particularly where they be voters, but also in Washington where they're not, have all been courteous and nice folk. They've got a tough job having to do kind of a monotonous gig, and, and they're not the most popular people to see when you, you know, got to go through that. It's not like customs at Checkpoint Charlie, but still is something you don't look forward and relish. The other is about the TWIC cards, and I reiterate the concerns we've got in Memphis with the TWIC cards, and they're important, but that it seems like there could be a better way to uh, allow the people that receive them to pick them up rather than have to do it personally. They could be done through the mail like driver's licenses and, uh, and other licenses are. Uh, uh, improvement in that system would be helpful in my community. Now, let me, who, who's the expert here on, on the process we go through at the airport? Uh, the airport would be m myself. Let, let me ask you this. Today, for the first time, I was asked to take off my watch. Why? Well, while I clearly wasn't there with you, it's possible that the, our divest officer, the individual who's working to facilitate the travel of customers, uh, might have felt that it would alarm and that you might have had an easier experience by removing it, but uh, you're not required to remove your watch. Well, they made it to, like everybody was. She was announcing, take off your watch. And just like with the very flawed systems that they have for onboard diagnostics and the check engine light and folks being able to get their car inspected, if the light's on, even if your car doesn't emit any type of, of carbon uh, vapors over and above what's expected, they won't pass you. And they say, well, well, it will save you problems in the future. That's not EPA's job, nor is it your job to make it less likely. I mean, I don't, just, I don't get it. It made no sense to me at all. And she said, you've got to take it off. 
and he's just like, the rules need to be consistent. I mean, for a while we didn't do shoes, and then the guy had the shoe, and then some places had shoes and some didn't. Now today I noticed shoes must not be in a, in a, in a bin, but they must be laid flat on the, the conveyor belt. Is that a uniform rule? That is not a rule in place today. There, at, at one point, we actually changed our procedure with shoes and have subsequently, in, in some time ago, changed that back to allow them to be placed in a bin or on the uh, belt, however it works Well, in Memphis, they've got a sign that says they must be placed flat on the conveyor belt, which is not a big deal, but sometimes your shoes then get crushed between two bags. And if you care about your shoes, that's not wonderful. Uh, the watch thing just seems it's the inconsistency of everything that gets you. And, and I'm, I'm comfortable in my manhood, and so the guy was fine, didn't have a problem. But, uh, you know, I got out and he wanted to pat me down, and he patted down my chest. You know, it's the same soap I use every day. Uh, never been patted down before on my chest, you know. The machine must have messed up, all I can figure. Again, I can't speak to your specific situation, but I can look into it for you. I'm not terribly concerned. It just seems like there should be some consistency. And the machine sometimes may be set at different levels or something, because sometimes you go through and they want it to look at your arm or look at this or that. And I mean, I'm, I'm not the bionic man. And, and any, well, I wouldn't, well, whatever. Uh, I don't have any parts that are, that are you know, newer, you know, metallic. That just makes no sense. So our goal is to be uniform and consistent. And at the same time, we also want to be random and unpredictable at times um, because we find that's helpful um, in, terms of our, uh, in terms of our work in security. But we are looking for a uniform and consistent experience for travelers as they come through. And as I said, I'm happy to follow up on that. I agree with Mr. Boswell that there probably should be some type of a system where you have your, your most likely or the people that you've no, they're frequent flyers and are safe and not going to do any. One day there was this lady there who's got the richest husband in town almost. And she's got a place in Aspen and she's got a place in France and they were going through all of her. If anybody wants to stay alive, it's her. I mean, she's got it all. And they were going through all of her stuff. And I mean, when they saw that, they should have realized <laughs> this woman wants to live. So sometimes it is a little common sense. Uh, how much did the puffers cost us? the whole puffer process? So the puffers predate uh, my time at TSA. I can take that question for the record and get back to you. We talked earlier about the disposal fee for the puffers. And their history, I know that, but that was a loser from Jump Street, too. I mean, here in Washington, there's one line had a puffer and one line didn't. So if you were a terrorist, you'd go through the line that didn't have the puffer, thinking the puffer worked. The fact the puffer doesn't work, the terrorist could have chosen either line. But they said, well, they give extra security was given on the other line if there was some problem. They looked at you even closer. Well, if they looked at you closer in the other line, why didn't they look at you closer in the puffer line? I mean, the puffer thing was really bad. But otherwise, all the TSA people are great. Got a tough job. I know you'll make it better. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Cohen. And the staff informs me that the puffers were around $30 million, if that's incorrect. Uh, Please let us know. And I think the same situation exists today. I have, I fly home uh, sometimes on American, sometimes on United. If you're going to United at DCA, you go through a, a, a full body scanner. If you go on American, you go through a metal detector. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out there's a potential issue there. Uh, we'll now uh, recognize the gentleman from North Carolina for five minutes, Mr. Coble. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I arrived belatedly. For that, I apologize. I had a conflicting schedule. Mr. S then maybe these questions may have already been pursued. Mr. Sadler, what has been the total cost of the TWIC program to the federal government and the private sector? Yeah, to date, the program costs are approximately $374 million, and that would include $100 million in appropriations and about uh, $274 million in user fees uh, for individuals who have paid for the TWIC card. And that's, that's the, the federal government and the private sector both? Uh, yes, sir. That's the appropriated money to start the program, the $100 million, and then $274 million was the user fees when you enroll and get a TWIC card issued to you. Uh, thank you, sir. Admiral, well, how much, what is the amount of money that you, that you allocate for TWIC administration each year? Um, ours is very minimal. Uh, we've expended a, about $2 million looking at uh, mostly commercial off-the-shelf technology. That's $2 million annually? Uh, to date. 
Uh, that does not include uh, the day-to-day the -day expenses of, of our personnel that do a number of missions. One of those is validating Twix at these facilities, uh, but that's part of our mission set already. And how many Coast Guard personnel uh, are dedicated to oversight of the TWIC program? Uh, they're not dedicated solely to TWIC, but they do facility inspections, and TWIC is just one element of that. So they're looking at everything from you know, what infrastructure is in place. Um, and so that, those exist at all of our sectors, all of our ports uh, throughout the United States. And one example of that is we recently shut down a facility in Miami because it didn't have the appropriate safeguards, unrelated to TWIC, um, but there were literally holes in the fence line that would allow uh, you know, people with uh, no business to enter into those facilities. And, and how long has TWIC been online? Uh, well, we, uh, TWIC was implemented in 2009 on April 15th, uh, and that's when 2,700 facilities were required to have TWIC. Um, and, and on that milestone date, all facilities uh, were in compliance. Uh, the TWIC reader is going to be critical as we go forward uh, because that will be the next uh, enabling mechanism uh, because that biometric chip is really what provides the next level of security uh, beyond the visual recognition that's on the existing Twix. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, gentlemen. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no one else on the other side, I will go to Mrs. Blackburn from Tennessee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank the committee for allowing me to participate today. Uh, this is an issue, TSA and their participation and their conduct is something that is important to my constituents. And uh, Mr. Lord and Mr. McLaughlin have both mentioned uh, constituent satisfaction, customer satisfaction as a goal. I would just uh, commend to you looking at The Economist magazine's online poll, which they have up right now. And the question they're asking is whether or not changes made to airport security since 9-11 have done more harm than good. And at last check, as I checked, it was 87 percent of the readers agree that changes at airport security have done more harm than good. So, gentlemen, I would contend that we are not doing our best at customer service. And I think Mr. Conley, uh, my colleague from the other side of the aisle, spoke well to that. I want to talk with you a little bit about the Viper teams. Because on October 20th, 2011, my home state of Tennessee became the first state in the country to deploy Viper teams simultaneously at five way stations and two bus stations. The teams included your TSOs, uh, BDOs, explosive detection, K-9 teams. My office was informed by TSA that the point of operation was for TSA agents to recruit truck drivers into the first observer highway security program. The TSOs and the BDOs involved in the operation were only supposed to be handing out recruitment brochures since neither position has actual federal law enforcement training. However, I've got a couple of posters here. You can see back here. If you look at uh, these posters, I'll call that one Exhibit A. And if you were watching the video of this transaction, you would see that this individual who is designated as a TSA employee is walking around and inspecting the truck. So if they were supposed to be handing out brochures, what were they doing inspecting the truck, and what type training do the TSOs and the BDOs receive to detect abnormalities or potential threats in semi-trucks? Mr. McLaughlin. Thank you. Uh, first, the exercise, or I should say the Viper that you reference in uh, your state of Tennessee was, uh, it, it's important to know, it was a joint training exercise with 23 different agencies, both federal, state, and local, where TSA was invited to participate. Um, and by all accounts, uh, the, the two- or three-day exercise went off uh, very well. It was um, an important opportunity for us to build relationships uh, to ensure that in the event of a real national security uh, emergency, we have the types of relationships in Sir, place. Sir, you are using my time, uh, but I would just ask what type training do they have You're to actually do these inspections and to detect the abnormalities that would be there on our nation's highways? Because they have no federal law enforcement training, correct? Dur during this exercise, the officers did not conduct any screening of any vehicles um, or, nor okay, Let drivers. me put up uh, poster number two. 
then why did uh, they ask to open the top of this, uh, the, open this truck and look at this? Was there a specific threat to Tennessee highways on October 20, 2011? And was there any intelligence suggesting that a suspected terrorist may be driving a semi-truck across Tennessee? And uh, were there specific threats that were deterred by conducting this operation? Well, I can't talk about threats that might have been deterred. I can tell you, again, that this was a training exercise, uh, not an exercise based on active intelligence in the state. Okay. Mr. Sadler, do you have anything to add to that? No, ma'am. You don't? Well, our, uh, there again, I want to go back to this question. What kind of specific training do they have to be on the nation's highways conducting these kind of searches? TSOs and BDOs do not receive specific training with regard to screening vehicles in the highway mode of transportation. Okay. The canine team that I believe that I see up there, although it is from a distance, appears to be a multimodal dog that is trained in that mode of transportation. So even though our TSOs have no federal law enforcement training, you are um, pleased that they are participating in these type exercises? Again, the VIPER program is set up to provide a visual deterrent and to work in conjunction with our state and local partners in all modes of transportation. And part of that, again, is to build the relationships in times of an exercise. So these TSOs who have been administratively reclassified from being screeners and processors and given no federal law enforcement training are going to be out on our nation's highways in our seaports and participating in, um, in this type of activity. I am not sure I understood that as a question. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. Based on the performance that you have seen with the VIPER teams um, and their ability to prevent specific terrorist threats, what kind of grade would you give them? I think that our VIPER teams do a very good job um, in a mode of transportation where we have very limited resources. I think our VIPER teams working in conjunction with state and local agencies uh, do a very good job of providing a visible deterrent uh, to people that might be uh, attempting to do something bad. A to, a to F, what kind of grade would you give them? I don't know that I have the experience to, to say specifically. Based on the experience I do have, I would give them a grade in the range of a B plus to an A minus, and that largely just based on the length of time that the program has been in place. It is a program that is only five years old in totality. Okay. I would just remind you that your agency has um, agreed that performance measures need to be developed for the VIPER team so that there can be uh, some measured results and some quantifiable data, and we will follow that as we move forward. One last question that I would have for you. Um, have the VIPER teams ever pulled over cars, SUVs, or vans? Uh, I'm not aware of a TSA asset on a Viper team pulling over a car or van, but I can take that question for the record. I would love to have uh, that answer because, to my knowledge, there is no terrorist that has ever driven a semi-truck. And so uh, we find it very curious, the method that was being employed with the Viper teams and their presence. And you can go look at the Zazi example or the Shazad example, and those were cars and SUVs. They were not semi-trucks. I yield back. Thank you very much. And we will now start our second round of uh, questioning. And I will give it a go for uh, five minutes, and then we will go to uh, Mr. Cummings. Um, as, as we talk about the SPOT program uh, for, for a minute, uh, if a BDO uh, SPOT agent were uh, able to see something that they considered to be a suspicious behavior, uh, what, 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 what's the follow-up there? What can they uh, do? Do they engage the person in conversation? Uh, you know, what's the procedure when a SPOT agent tech detects something? Is there something they can do? And if so, can you tell me what that is? So uh, in our SPOT program, um, our officers are trained to observe uh, behavior and engage in um, casual conversations with individuals. Um, if, uh, if the circumstance warrants, 
they can engage local law enforcement, excuse me, local law enforcement for further follow-up. And so, that, so if they detected something suspicious, can they stop them from boarding the plane? Uh, if, if you're asking can they physically detain an individual, spot officers are not trained, um, no, nor do we want them to physically detain an individual. All, all right. Again, so so local I, law enforcement. I set a spot officer off for some reason, and I just wander on and get on my, I can just walk on and get on my plane. I mean, is, is that, is, they can't stop me. So I'm sorry, I apologize. I misunderstood your question. I, I thought you were speaking right. physically. A spot officer, um, if, they're, if they have reason to believe that, that you are suspicious, can engage a local law enforcement officer um, who will interview you and either um, uh, send you on your way or, uh, or ask you additional questions. And has a spot officer ever stopped somebody from boarding a plane? Not to my knowledge. Um, I, I, again, there are times when a spot officer will engage in conversation, um, but I cannot, uh, I don't know of a time when an officer has stopped someone from getting on an airplane. And how much are we paying these guys to chat up passengers? So our spot officers are paid in the same range as our federal officers, beginning at the F band and uh, topping out at the G band, so somewhere between $37,000 and $50,000. All right. Um, uh, last year, uh, in TSA Oversight Part 1 hearing by the OGR committee, uh, Chairman Micah uh, asked some panels uh, about, the, uh, about the effectiveness of the, uh, of the full body scanners and whether or not they could uh, detect body cavity inserts or surgically implanted explosive devices, and the unanimous answer to that question was no. On July 6, 2011, the TSA released a notice to airlines warning them of the increased threat caused by explosive uh, implant methods. And earlier this month, someone posted a video on the Internet demonstrating how to defeat these machines. Why are we continuing to spend hundreds of million dollars on technology with such obvious uh, vulnerabilities? And what have you done with respect to uh, the uh, hearing last month and uh, the revelation that they, they can't detect some of these things? First of all, I would point out that, um, that uh, recently our administrator testified uh, with regard to AIT effectiveness, and there is a follow-up hearing, as I understand it, in the month of April. Uh, we'll hear in a classified setting where he'll be able to get into more, uh, more details. So I will tell you that um, we obviously on a daily basis review vulnerabilities in our system and ensure that we have mitigations in place, including AIT, which is our best deterrent or our best detection against metallic and non-metallic threats on the body. And is it your plan to replace all the magnetometers with AITs? Um, that is not our current plan. Um, based on sort of our evolution uh, with the risk-based security, we're looking at the best way to deploy the best assets we have in configurations that make sense across the system. And are they getting, as they're purchased, are they getting uh, deployed in a timely manner? I, I know there are some warehouses that a lot of this equipment sits in as it gets uh, deployed and we're, the last I'd heard we weren't using you know, modern deployment techniques like drop shipping them to uh, the airports. So to my knowledge there are no AITs uh, in the warehouse uh, that you refer to. The AITs are being deployed readily um, and our utilization uh, numbers are improving dramatically on a daily basis. And where are we with getting a peer-reviewed safety evaluation of these machines specifically uh, for TSA agents that are nearby and operating them and uh, frequent uh, screenies, be they frequent flyers? Or I realize now the airline staffs typically are diverted through uh, magnetometers, but you know, I, I saw a, a, a pregnant female TSA officer uh, right by one of those machines and, and was concerned because I understand there's no peer reviewed safety checks there. So, with regard to the backscatter uh, technology, uh, which is the one that uses radiation, there have been three, as I understand it, uh, independent studies, including one from NIST, one from the Food and Drug Administration, and one from the U.S. Army. In addition to that, the machines are subjected to regular uh, dosimeter testing to ensure um, that they fall within safe limits. And with every test that has been conducted, uh, the units are well below uh, established limits. All of the tests that I have just uh, referred to, both NIST and uh, uh, the Food and Drug, as well as the Army, and as well as the surveys uh, with the dosimeter surveys, are available on TSA's public website at tsa.gov. And, and Mr. Lord, are you comfortable with those? I, uh, the IG recently reported on this and repeated uh, much of the same information Mr. McLaughlin just provided. I, uh, 
I am comfortable with what I heard, but if you are interested in having us conduct follow-up, I can certainly talk to your staff after your day. Thank you very much. We will be in touch. Uh, we will now recognize the uh, ranking member, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Assistant Secretary Sadler, the GAO reported that its audit found that TSA had inadequate screening systems in place to identify applicants ineligible for Twix and to deny the issuance of to deny the issuance of Twix to them. What steps have been taken has TSA taken to address these findings? Well, the first thing that we did was we created a, a executive level oversight board coordination with DHS to map out our short term, medium term, and long term strategy to address these uh, recommendations. Uh, immediately after receiving the report and the recommendations, we retrained the trusted agents. Those are the individuals who uh, collect the information at the enrollment sites on their ability to identify fraudulent documentation. We also made system modifications that allow us to collect more information on the documents that are collected, pass that to our adjudicators so they could be reviewed more thoroughly. On the, the midterm and longer term plan, uh, we are we're making arrangements with the U.S. IDENT system, U.S. VISIT, so we can send our fingerprints into that uh, repository and check our fingerprints that we have against our fingerprints in their repository to see if anybody is uh, applying under multiple names or identities. Uh, and then uh, the other long-term project that we are working on is a rat pack capability with FBI. And what that means is currently we are required to submit fingerprints a new set of fingerprints each time we want a criminal history records check. What we are working towards is seeing if we can submit the, the fingerprints we have on file to the FBI to get a criminal history records check without hauling somebody in to submit a new set of prints. And also that capability will tell us if the individual has committed a, a, some type of criminal offense in between the applications that they make every five years. So there's a number of things we're doing. We took the recommendations very seriously. We were doing the best we can with the program. We want to, we want to make it the best that it can be. Now, during a hearing on TWIC held by the Senate Commerce Committee in May of 2011, Mr. Lloyd indicated in response to a question from uh, Senator Boozman that a normal driver's license is at least as secure probably in many cases more secure than a, than a TWIC. Is a TWIC more or less secure than a normal driver's license? I would have to defer to uh, Mr. Lord on how he came to that conclusion. But for the TWIC, we think the TWIC is a secure credential because you have to remember prior to TWIC, you could go into a port and gain access to a port with multiple uh, credentials, possibly a credit card, a, a union card, uh, any number of credentials. So the first thing I would say about the TWIC is it is the first time a common credential has been issued in a maritime environment, which means we can train to that credential. The second thing I would say is we developed uh, uh, many security features to put on that card, and we did that in coordination with other uh, agencies, including the Forensics Document Lab at ICE. So we did the best we could to make that card uh, secure. And then you also need to keep in mind that it has a biometric on it. And although the readers aren't in place yet, the Coast Guard does have portable handheld readers that they can use to do random checks uh, and security checks, as well as do the checks as far as their uh, port security inspections and vessel uh, uh, security inspections each year. Now, Admiral Zenkov, Section 809 of the Coast Guard uh, Authorization Act of 2010 exempts mariners who do not need access to the secure area of a vessel from the requirement that they obtain a TWIC. Coast Guard Policy Letter 1115 implements Section 809, but still requires those seeking their first Mariner credential to visit a TWIC enrollment center, essentially to complete the TWIC enrollment process and pay the enrollment fee. Admiral, I understand that the TWIC exemption has been estimated by the Coast Guard to apply to potentially 60,000 of the 210,000 licensed mariners in the United States. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. And uh, to date, we have only had approximately 68 take advantage of that 809 provision. And why do you think that is? 
Um, for some, uh, they see that TWIC as, as a, an employment opportunity. Um, and so if an employer uh, would ask, why do you not have a TWIC um, in this competitive environment, uh, they see that as advantageous to have that credential and an up-to-date background check. I see my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you very much. There, there are quite a few uh, other questions, and uh, some of the other members that had to leave uh, did want to ask some additional questions. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we will be submitting additional questions uh, in writing to, uh, to complete the record uh, as, as we finish this up. Also, without objection, I'd like to uh, leave seven days open for members to uh, submit both those questions and uh, opening statements. Uh, I'd like to thank each and every member of the panel for uh, being with us, commend you for your uh, service to this country, and urge you to continue to look for ways to improve what uh, you and your agencies are able to do to uh, better serve uh, and better spend uh, more efficiently uh, spend and use the taxpayers' money to provide a safe transportation environment uh, for all of us. Again, uh, thank you for being here, and uh, we're done.